Thank you so very much. If you are able to stand with us, we'd like to sing together, do it again.
If you don't know the storyline of Harry Potter, Harry is this young man that some think is the chosen one. And yet, at a very young age, he finds himself with his aunt and uncle. And even though his cousin has this wonderful, glorious bedroom, he is assigned a cupboard under the stairs, a closet under the stairs. Where we assign someone, the space we give to someone, suggests the value that we give to that person. And it's not just people. The space that we give to God in our lives. Is it just some little corner of our lives, or is it something a bit larger, something a bit more prominent? That is the question that we're going to be exploring this morning as we worship. Let us continue in song.
light and provide us both courage and hope. A loving God, open our minds to your wisdom and provide us both the discernment and understanding. O God of peace, open our fists and provide us the capacity to release our grip on both the resentment and bitterness. O God of kindness, open our lives and provide us a clear sense of both direction and purpose. This we request in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Well, I say, good morning, church. Good morning. Uh, I welcome you to Cypress Creek Christian Church, a community striving to put love first in all things. That is a part of our vision and mission. We continue to live into that, not only in this context, but of course, when we live our lives beyond these walls. I want to first give a shout out to our seniors who graduated over the last week, week and a half or so, Anna Steves, Ashley and Matthew Borman, who are here this morning, Zach Froge, Braxton Budd, and Elkie Ridenhauer. Uh, and it's just really a blessing. Uh, they and some others went on a trip together this past week, in part just because they haven't been able to do much as a group over the last year, year and a half, and I know they had a great time. Let me just say, I think the world is in good hands with that. I want to give you uh, just a little bit of information. Uh, beginning of July, we're going to do another food drive for NAM. Uh, we'll be giving more information about some of the specific items in the days ahead. But just put that in the back of your mind. And then I want to talk a little bit about that building uh, over there. Uh, you may actually see some workers showing up shortly. I thought they were going to come a little earlier today and begin work uh, because we have a graduation in that space this Friday. The uh, school for funeral directors, they were having their graduations before the flood and the pandemic, and they're one of the organizations that's been calling like every six weeks for the last four years going, is it open yet? Is it open yet? And so the contractor said they would make it happen. So they need to finish the floodgates so you can actually get into the building. They are going to hopefully be doing that in the next 24 hours. The stage is in, but it's not yet stained. There's still some work where the choir sits just above the stage. And there's a lot of dust. But supposedly that will be cleaned up starting Thursday at noon in preparation for the graduation. Which means that we'll be probably at least, you know, whether both services will be moving over there for a couple of weeks just to be able to taste of it or exactly what, but you know that you'll have an opportunity to visit the Centrum in the next couple of weeks. And then I want to just share some information that I think is really exciting for Cypress Creek Christian Church. Our own Hannah Fitch, which she moved back to Chicago not long ago, was on staff here. Well, Hannah is scheduled for her ordination on August 1st at her home church in Illinois, where her mother is the pastor. Mariah is going to go as our congregational representative to that ordination. And then Josh Jackson, who is actually here with us this morning. Uh, Josh was one of our summer interns. Well, Josh graduated from Vanderbilt and will be ordained August the 14th, and then will begin as the associate minister at Allisonville Christian Church in Indianapolis in mid-July, which is exciting. I know that congregation. I know their pastor, Diane. She's absolutely wonderful, and I know the not only a gift to that congregation to have Josh, but I think it will be a blessing to him as well. And, and then Tamika Nelson and Mariah are both finishing up their seminary work. They're in the, kind of the last steps with the region with all the interviews they have to do in preparation for ordination. And I think soon they will be beginning that process of putting a date on the calendar for their ordination. Folks, that's four people connected to this congregation who will be ordained in the next year. I would suggest there are very few churches in our denomination who can say that. So, a little point of pride for us as a community of faith. Well, today, we're continuing with this idea of overflowing. And we're going to be looking at a passage from Ephesians, the third chapter. I actually referenced a part, at least a piece of it, last Sunday, though I will confess I said Ephesians 4, not 3, so I'm just sorry for that mistake last week. But Ephesians, Ephesians 3, beginning with verse 16, it says this. 
I pray that according to the riches of the divine glory, God may grant that you be strengthened in your inner being with power through the Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine to God be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Forever and ever. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Gracious God, may your power at work within us Allow for us to glimpse something new, something life-giving and transformative. We might glimpse it within these words that have been shared in this day. Amen. Has anyone ever told you that you are full of it? I had an uncle who would often say, Bruce, you are full of of meadow muffins. I thought it was a compliment, you know, anything had to do with muffins, that sounded like something good, only to learn that meadow muffins were a nice way of saying cow patties. <laughs> so, when you understand where he was going with that. But what would it mean for someone to say to you that you are full of it, with the it, with the it, being God. When I first arrived at uh, the church in Naples where I served, I got a tour of the, of the church, including my office. It was a, a big office. An embarrassingly big office. There was this big desk, and there was the chair that I would sit in, and then there were two chairs on the other side of the desk. And then there was a big conference table with like six, ta six, six chairs around it. And then in the corner there was a couch and two big oversized chairs. And there was space that I wanted to bring in a treadmill or, you know, I had a small basketball court in there. I mean, it was a huge office. And when I commented on that, one of the longtime members said, well, it was built with one of our former ministers in mind. How's that? I asked. Well, he needed an office to fit his ego, I was told. <laughs> and then I was told, hopefully, the office would be big enough for mine. <laughs> well, I would suggest that that office was a poor use of the church's space, wasted space. And my question this morning that I kind of want us to focus on is related to space, how we use space, and how available do we make that space. As a church, Cyber Street Christian Church, and our connection to the community center, I would suggest that we use, well, prior to the flood and the pandemic, we used our space very well. We have a management agreement with the community center, and they are the, the entity that connects with the larger community and helps to bring them in. The community center helps us fulfill one of our core values, which is hospitality. But today, I want us to talk about some other space. The space within us as individuals and within us as a community. And to think about how that space is used and whether or not there is any space for what is important. When I was serving the church in Kansas City, we had a woman in there, in that congregation, who was a bit of a character. 
She was kind of a curmudgeon, and she owned that word. But she didn't drive, and so people in the church would go by and get her, not only for church, but for other things that she needed to attend. Uh, but she didn't want people to come to the door. She told them to just pull up in the driveway, how long she would come out. Well, one afternoon, the ambulance was called to her house. The EMTs went in, and they got her to the hospital. The EMTs then contacted their old services. And because she had no family, they reached out to us in the church. And we were asked, with her permission, to enter the house and to begin cleaning it up in preparation for her return home. And so I went with a group, and we entered the front door. For decades, come to find out, she had been collecting newspapers. And I kid you not, we opened up the door, and there was this narrow pathway. I had to bring my shoulders in just to fit down that pathway. Stacks of paper, six, seven feet tall, and she was like five to one. I don't even know how she got them that high. And it went to a T, and to, to the right, you would go down to her bedroom. The only room that didn't have any paper was the bathroom. But at the end of the hallway was her bedroom, and the, the stacks of paper were tightly around her bed and her little dresser, except in the area where one stack had collapsed on the bed. If you go the other direction, you would go to the living room where just a little hole was carved out against these high stacks where there was a chair and a TV, and then there was the kitchen that it was also stacked full of paper. As you went to the kitchen, you passed the dining room, but you didn't even know you were in the dining room because there was so much paper. We filled two dumpsters filled with newspaper. Someone could say, well, every corner of the house was filled. Was it not a good use of the space? Well, every corner was filled. But it was filled with what should have been removed. Because it was a spark, a simple spark, been let loose in that house that would have gone up in flames in moments. The Apostle Paul talks about Christ indwelling in our hearts and the fullness of God filling us. I find that imagery beautiful, but how much of our lives is really filled with God? How much space do we actually dedicate to the presence of God? And how much space is actually filled with unnecessary debris and unhealthy and unnecessary stuff? It makes me wonder about inviting God in but only offering God a little available space. Some minuscule amount of space that is left between the piles of worry, the stacks of bitterness, the heaps of anger and hatred, the mounds of unhealthy emotions like feelings of failure and guilt and long-held grief. How much space is really available? Dr. Edwards was a missionary to India in the early 1900s. He was going there to help create a clinic in a community that had absolutely no medical care. He was told that he would live at a home of some people that lived on the outskirts of town. Well, when he arrived, a horse-drawn carriage, they pulled up in front of the house. It was, it was a mansion. I mean, a mansion. He was overwhelmed. But they didn't stop at the front door. It went around the side and to the back, where he was shown the servants' quarters, a small room with a, a small kitchenette area. The family was gone. They would be traveling for more than two years. But he was told that the door that led to the rest of the house he wasn't to use. He was never to go over there. So every night he slept in his little area. Every day he would go into town and participate in the construction of this clinic. And then after it was built, these two small rooms that made up the clinic would be filled with patients. And then at night he would return to his little quarters where just on the other side of the wall 
for a dozen bedrooms that went unused. It seemed like wasted space, he said. What is a good use of our space? I think the Apostle Paul looked around and saw plenty of places where space was not being used well. But I think the places that he was most concerned about were those places within individual and within the corporate life of the community. In Corinthians, one of the letters he wrote, he talks about not just individuals, but the community, the collective body of believers, how they are to be the temple for the Holy Spirit. Yet, yeah, how often do we confine that divine presence to some small, inconspicuous corner of our lives, while so much other space goes unused? Or maybe it's filled with all kinds of other things that are not of God and refuse to relinquish that space to the presence of God. I mean, I think it's one thing to invite God into our lives. It's something very different to actually have space for God to dwell. You can invite family to come and visit you, but if you do not have a place for them to sleep, because you have every room filled, they're probably going to go find a hotel. What does God do when we refuse to make room? Paul writes, amidst the reference to Christ dwelling and the fullness of God filling us, he talks about the importance of the process. This dwelling, this filling, it happens when we are being Rooted and grounded in love, Paul writes. Rooted and grounded. Both of those are verbs, active verbs. And notice it says, you are being rooted and grounded in love. It is an active process. This indwelling of Christ within us, the fullness of God filling us, these things happen as we become more and more rooted and grounded in love. If you think about it, that makes sense. I mean, it really does. What happens when, when we become more secure and confident in love? What happens when we experience the freely given and life-liberating love of God revealed in Jesus? I believe that the clutter in our lives the stuff that probably should not be there, suddenly the junk that we cling to in our search for security or use to mask our insecurities, suddenly we begin to let go of that. We begin to release it. But I don't think it stops there. I believe there's another step when we go beyond simply experiencing love, to act actually practicing the sharing of love. In 1 John, the fourth chapter, we read, Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us, and God's love is perfected within us. It begins with the language of God loving us. And that experience of love is important, but the next step is how we ought to love one another. In the act of loving another human being, in the act of loving creation that surrounds us, God begins to live in us, and God's love, it says, is perfected within us. Love, practicing of love, allows for love to be more rooted and grounded within our lives. And I believe the source of that love also begins to move in. I mean, isn't that true just about anything? You can read about it. You can be on the receiving end of it. But until you practice it, practice it on a regular basis, Take it out for a test drive. Experience the challenges that come with loving someone that may be a little bit difficult to love. 
Until that happens, I don't think it really becomes a part of who you are. And 1 John reminds us that God is love. So when we practice love, not only is love more rooted in us, but we become more grounded in the one who is the source of love. Not long ago, I was reading an article. 14 ways of adding space to your house without breaking the bank. And the first big question was, is it better to build out or to build up? What makes more sense in your situation? Yet I would suggest that a lot of people who are looking around the house and saying we need more space, should we build up, should we build out, really probably just need to clean out their house and find that they have plenty of space to begin with. I think we look at our own lives sometimes and we think there's just no space currently for God. And so how might I be able to add on and make space for God when in fact maybe what we should start with is the removal of some of the unneeded stuff that is in our lives and make space for God to more fully dwell. Because in the beginning, according to Genesis, we were created in the image of God. And should that mean that we are already the perfect dwelling place for the fullness of God? Assuming that we've not filled that space up with unnecessary stuff. One of my favorite pastors, Reverend Dolores Turner, one of those people who just had an amazing spirit, and oh my, could she preach. I asked Dolores to come and to preach when we were doing a commissioning service for a group that was going on a mission trip. And in that sermon, Dolores talked about that very common phrase that people share after they return from a trip like that. She said to the group, in a few weeks when you come back from your mission trip, you'll probably say to someone out there, I got so much more out of this trip than I put into it. She said, you know, that's more than just a cute statement. Because it really happens, she told us. Because when we humble ourselves, when we feel compassion for somebody, when we share love, the love of God, what does it require? It requires us to be vulnerable. It requires some tenderness. And she said, we become soft, like a sponge, like a holy sponge, she said. And when we are like a holy sponge, we soak up the presence of God that is all around us. So you do, she said, get more out of those kinds of experience because you made yourself like a sponge, able to, to soak in that presence all around you. I love that imagery of the sponge, the holy sponge, because I think we were made for the indwelling of Christ, for the fullness of God to fill us. Yet it happens only when we are rooted in love and grounded in the one who is the source of that love. So my question to you all is what would it mean for someone to say to you, you are full of it? When they say the word it, they mean God. What would it mean? It would mean that, that someone saw in you the presence of God. And if they saw the presence of God, that means that they saw love in you. And I don't think you just see love like some object out there. It's something that they experienced through you. And it happens because we make space. We make space for God to dwell. We make space for Christ to dwell. We make space for the one that is the source of love. Can you join me in prayer? O Holy One in creation, you seek to dwell within the 
within the structure that carries your image, within the body that Paul called the, the temple of the Holy Spirit. With so many acts of, of violence in our country and around the globe right now, there is a need for more than for just talk, more than conversations about your love. There is, there is a real need for individuals and, and communities to be filled and empowered with the indwelling of your loving and transformative presence. Let us acknowledge the work required if, if such a presence is to take root and be grounded in our lives. Wherever there is a need for mercy, wherever encouragement would be helpful, wherever the mending of brokenness is required, we seek out your spirit that facilitates the process by which a healthy space is created within us, a space more available to you and the gifts that you bring to the world. May the work that we do, the spiritual disciplines we practice, the time we give to the community of faith, the energy given to the sharing of love, may it all better prepare us to receive you anew, to receive your presence and the love that you have for us, and the love that you want to pour not only into us, but through us and to the world. We offer these words now in the name of Christ. Amen. i
Diane was the children's, or excuse me, the youth minister at a church I served years ago. And Diane was also a nurse uh, by training. And she, when she was teaching younger people about communion, she would say, you're taking a little bit of Jesus into your tummy. But then being the nurse she was, she would say, your, your body's system will take that to your heart. You will take it to your mind. You will take it to your hands and to your feet. I love the image that she provided with that. Because this morning, we're going to take a little Jesus in our tummies. But the hope is it doesn't just stay there. Hopefully, our systems take it to our hearts and to our heads, to our hands and to our feet. For the world around us, needs desperately to experience the love, the kindness, the mercy, the generosity that we have seen and revealed in Jesus Christ. What we are called to share with the world. But it begins by making sure that, that the source of those gifts first has space to move into our lives so that wherever we might be, we are taking that presence into the world. Well, as we prepare for some time at the table, I hope you all received the communion elements. If not, raise your hands, we're singing, and those will be brought to you. Let us now prepare for communion as we share the song.
And so here at this table, it is, it's not our table. There's no rule of man that governs it. God invites all. And as a result, we share his love and his invitation to all. Please join us in prayer. God of light, we ask for your blessing on this bread and cup as we prepare our hearts to come to the table. It is here that we find community and call, where we are rooted and grounded in love and grace. But let us not forget that those gifts are not only really found here, but that we are, as your servants, are called to bring them out into the world around us. We know that it is only through sharing the love of God that we can change the world. As we embrace that call, may you hear our voices raised together as one in the prayer your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And be us not in temptation, but deliver us. On the night he was arrested, Jesus gathered with his disciples in an upper room to partake in an ordinary meal. During that meal, he took an ordinary loaf of bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and said, this is my body, broken for you. You should be tapped with it. In a like manner, at the end of the meal, he took the cup and raised it and said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, freely given for you and for the many. Do this in remembrance of me. We are a people that are called together to be an encouragement to one another, to be in support of one another. I think about the baby dedications we do. It's been a while with the pandemic. But in the baby dedication, a question is asked of the parents. It's then followed up with a question to the congregation. A question, maybe an invitation, to be supportive of this family and to participate in helping to raise this child. And you know, never, in all the years I've done baby dedications, no one has said, no, never mind, I don't want to do that. I always get this enthusiastic, yes. Let us make sure it's not just for the youngest ones. Let us recognize that we are in community together. And as people are working on trying to make space in their lives for God, Luke, we recognize that this is something that we as a community can help one another. When we're struggling to let go of something, to have someone who has already been on that journey come alongside us and say, you know, I'm willing to journey with you. What a gift that is. To have people that say, I'll pray for you. And you know that when they say that, they are serious. To have people who say, I love you in this time, and I will continue to love you. It means the world. We need to make sure that we recognize the work that happens together. Because the more work we do as a community and how we make space, both in individuals and in our collective gathering, the more powerful the love of God will be in and through us. So this day, I invite you. I encourage you to make sure that you are working not just on yourself, but that you are willing to be that gift in someone else's life as they're trying to make more space for God. I invite you now, if you're able, please sing. And let us join our voices on our closing song.
full of the presence of God and better prepared to leave this space and continuing that, uh, continuing to be full of it, wherever you might go. For the world beyond these walls is desperately searching for a sense of, of God, of love, of mercy, kindness. And you may be the very instrument that God plans to use. Let us join together now in our common prayer. Gracious God, may your love and our lives come together in a life lived in love. May Jesus be our mentor and our model, and may the world see in us a life that is willing to put love first.